Okay, well, welcome back, folks. Uh, absolutely a gorgeous day here, a little cool. I was telling our host that I was a little sleep deprived from staying up late watching the football game last night. I guess I need to learn not to do that, but when the Chiefs play, I've just got to do it. So I uh, hope you're all looking forward to a wonderful Thanksgiving this week. Uh, hope you've all got friends that are coming in or family and uh, enjoy the good times. So we are finishing up the Civil War in the Ozarks today, and we're going to be talking specifically about the guerrilla war that took place inside the Ozarks in uh, the southern part of Missouri. So begin with, I've got my um, Ozarker of the day, and I can guarantee you everybody out here knows who this is. You just may not recognize him. This is one of the most famous men that rode with a guerrilla band in uh, the Civil War and ended up having a long storied career as an outlaw, lived into the 1900s. Yes, that is Frank James. That is the brother of Jesse James. Uh, Jesse, of course, uh, was assassinated in uh, earlier in the early 1880s. Uh, but Frank lived on for several more decades. In fact, he and Cole Younger, uh, one of the guys that rode with him in the uh, uh, guerrilla band during the Civil War uh, and rode with the James gang, along with his brothers, uh, lived until, I believe, close to 1920. Uh, so they, uh, they had a long life ahead of them. So let's look at the guerrilla warfare in the Ozarks. Now, we've already seen how the Confederates kind of lost, in a way, the Battle of Wilson's Creek. They may have won technically, but they lost because they failed to pursue it. And then the next spring, early spring, they were decisively beaten at the Battle of uh, Pea Ridge down in the southern part, north northwestern part of Arkansas. At that point, the Confederacy kind of gave up on Missouri. They, they just didn't have the manpower. Things were really heating up back east, and that's where they had to channel and focus their resources. And so in, uh, in a sense, they kind of gave up on Missouri. Now, it's not that they totally gave up, because what they did, they changed tactics. And we talked about this last week, how that they changed tactics uh, and started doing uh, efforts like uh, search and destroy missions and cavalry attacks and things like this. Rush into the Ozarks and Southern Missouri, uh, disrupt uh, activities, uh, steal stuff, cut telegraph wires, rip up railroad tracks, uh, do anything they could to harass the Union troops that were located in the Ozarks, as well as the civilian population. Eventually, they almost, in a sense, turned that over to bands of people that are not quite affiliated with the Confederate Army. And this is where the guerrilla warfare really gets started in the Ozarks. And folks, there's no other place in the United States that's more associated with guerrilla warfare during the Civil War than in the Ozarks. I mean, it was just absolutely horrible in the southern part of Missouri. And uh, on both sides, uh, we primarily think of it in terms of the, of the southern side, but there most certainly were uh, those that participated on the Union side. Uh, it had its roots in the old Kansas Jayhawkers and the Missouri Bushwhackers, uh, the uh, Kansas-Nebraska uh, conflict back in the eight, uh, late 1850s with uh, the Kansas and Nebraska Act and Bleeding Kansas that we talked about. And they didn't call themselves bushwhackers or guerrilla fighters. They called themselves partisan rangers. Uh, they, were, they considered themselves uh, soldiers. They just fought independently of the organized units and even though they many times uh, were given uh, kind of notice by the uh, by either the Union or the Southern forces, uh, for the most part, they fought independently without any kind of control. 
course, as you might imagine, that led to some really horrific situations. Um, as a result of all this, the Ozarks became just a devastated region during the latter half of the Civil War, after the Battle of Pea Ridge and the Battle of, uh, you know, some of the battles that immediately followed that. The result was that, you know, this guerrilla warfare just totally disrupted. And for the next four years, uh, Ozarks, the Ozarks basically descended into almost like a medieval time. And unfortunately, that even lasted quite a few years after the Civil War, as we'll find out uh, starting next week. We'll talk about the period of time after the Civil War. And you'll see that uh, it was a lawless region uh, for a good couple of decades. So who were these partisan rangers? Well, this is an actual photograph of, of three partisan rangers that fought on the southern side. Uh, we know who two of them are. The one with the one, that's little Archie Clements. That's a man by the name of Dave Poole. We don't know who this one was. Uh, these two actually ended up riding with the James Younger gang for quite a few years. Uh, Archie Clements ended up being kind of a, a mentor to Jesse. Uh, and he was considered to be just a, a really sadistic, almost psychopathic man. And, uh, you know, he was just a really violent person. He, though he was only about five foot tall and weighed about 110 pounds, he was just a, you know, a, a really vicious man. So this would, these are actually three of these partisan rangers. So who were the victims? Now, there were people that, particularly in the early part of the war, that stayed around the Ozarks and tried to make a living. One of these was a man by the name of Jesse Ballard James. No. Not the Jesse James, the outlaw, another Jesse James. He actually was the operator of the old Dot Mill down uh, in Ozark County. Dot Mill still stands today. It's uh, been turned into a tourist attraction on the North Fork River. And you can go there and uh, you can eat. Um, it's got kind of like a, a visitor's center type thing with, with lodging uh, back in the Rustic Mountains. But in 1861, it was just a mill for the people that lived around the North Fork River. And the operator was this Jesse Ballard James. Well, here was the problem. The Southern Partisan Rangers found out that he was milling corn for Union sympathizers. Most of the people that lived in that area were probably Southern sympathizers. But there were some Union sympathizers, and they came to warn him. And they told him, he said, listen here, guy, you got to stop this. If you continue milling corn for the Union sympathizers, you're going to end up having problems. And he was a stubborn man, and he basically said, I'll do whatever I want to do. And they warned him, and they said, well, don't do it anymore. Well, sure enough, he continued to do it. And a few weeks later, they paid him a visit and uh, snapped him up, along with two of the other workers, took him to a nearby tree and lynched him. Uh, fortunately for the other two, there were some federal troops around and they got there in time to save them, but it was too late for Jesse Ballard James. He was hung, leaving his family here of uh, a young son, two young daughters, and a, and a widow. By the way, the reason I know so much about this is Jesse Ballard James was one of my maternal great-great-great-grandfathers. Uh, my mother always told me that we, we were related to Jesse James, and I used to make fun of her, and I told her, I said, Mom, I said, everybody in the Ozarks is related to Jesse James, and she got pretty mad at me. She said, I'm telling you right now that one of your great-great-grandfathers was Jesse James. Well, I just ignored it because I didn't want to upset her anymore, uh, but after she passed and I got into uh, family genealogy, sure enough, I found out that we'd I did have a great, great, great grandfather named Jesse James. Wasn't the Jesse James, but when I get to heaven, I'm going to have to make sure and tell her that uh, and apologize to her for making fun of her because she most certainly was correct in that regard. So, who were some of these notorious guerrilla fighters? Well, there were hundreds of them, but I'm going to I'm going to show you about four of them. Uh, one of them was Sam Hildebrand. 
Now, Sam Hildebrand actually uh, was more in the southeastern part of the state, uh, down in the area around the Black River and the uh, uh, St. Francis River in that area, but he was still technically in the Ozarks. Uh, he's considered to be one of the absolute most notorious of the partisan rangers. Uh, his story is not unique. Uh, apparently, when the war started, he wasn't really sympathetic to one side or the other. He was just trying to make a living and trying to get along, which is probably what most people in the Ozarks were trying to do. In fact, the case, he had a brother that was serving in the Union Army. But it so happened that uh, some of the Union people in the town where they lived ended up missing some horses, and they accused Sam and Frank, one of his brothers, of stealing horses. Um, Frank was captured, ended up being hung. Sam escaped. And he was so upset about this, he vowed vengeance. He said, you know, for killing my brother, I am absolutely going to go on the rampage. Uh, and he ended up hunting down some of the soldiers that hung his brother Frank and killing them. The Union retaliated by burning his house, killing several of his relatives, including another brother, a 13-year-old brother, forcing his wife and his mother off the farm after they burned it, uh, just absolutely took vengeance upon Sam. Well, this really set him off. You know, if he was mad before and he was upset before, now he just went on an absolute uh, tour of vengeance and didn't stop even after the Civil War. Uh, he absolutely declared war on the Union and began killing any Union soldier he could find or any sympathizer with the Union. He had a rifle he called Kill Devil, and it said that when they finally killed him in 1872, he lived about seven years after the Civil War, still hunting down Union sympathizers. They said he had 80 notches on his stock. Um, <clears throat> Nobody knows for sure how many people he killed, but we're sure he killed a bunch. Uh, his reign of terror continued, like I said, after the war, and he was actually hunted down in 1870 by a couple of journalists, and they interviewed him and wrote his story down. And I just finished reading his autobiography just about two weeks ago, and it's an unbelievable autobiography. Uh, you know, he, he absolutely had no remorse for any of the actions that he took. This is a photograph of Sam Hildebrand. And here's a, here's a quote out of the book. He said, I make no apology to mankind for my acts of retaliation. I make no whining appeal to the world for sympathy. I sought revenge and I found it. The key to hell was not suffered to rust in the lock while I was on the war path. Um, so, you know, he just absolutely went on a rampage killing any Union sympathizer that he could find. Now, he is one of the more notorious bushwhackers, partisan rangers, whatever you want to call them. He was by no means the only one. Uh, there were hundreds of these people in the Ozarks on both sides. Another one served as the source for the movie The Outlaw Josie Wells. I bet a lot of you out there have seen the Clint Eastwood movie. Um, the outlaw Josie Wells. Most people don't realize that that character was based on a real-life partisan ranger from Phelps County, Missouri, uh, up around the Rolla, Missouri area, a man by the name of Bill Wilson. Uh, Bill Wilson, just kind of like Hildebrand, was just a kind of a happy-go-lucky type farmer. Uh, didn't really choose sides when the war broke out. Uh, you know, he just basically was wanting to try to get along and try to stay out of the way. Uh, and just like Hildebrand, he was accused of horse theft. And just like Hildebrand, the Union Army showed up, burned his farm, uh, stole his, um, most of his possessions, uh, ejected his family. And it was then that Wilson decided he was going to go after vengeance. And uh, he, just like Hildebrand, uh, also uh, had a book written about his life, and it's called Bushwhacker. And uh, it ended up being the source for the movie, The Ozark Josie, pardon me, The Outlaw Josie Wales. 
uh, that, like I said, is one of the more famous movies that Clint Eastwood made. Uh, and again, we don't know how many people that he killed. There are estimates it's in the triple digits. Uh, and he was never caught. Actually, what happened was he lived to be quite an old man down in Texas. And uh, he eventually was robbed and killed by two of his ex friends that rode with him during this war. Probably did it for a reward. Uh, there's no real knowledge about why they killed him, but it sounds like it probably killed him for a reward because he was still a wanted man even decades after the Civil War. So here's the book, Bushwhacker, the story of Missouri's most famous desperado. Uh, there's the movie poster about the outlaw Josie Wells, and that is the real Bill Wilson, the man that served as the source for the outlaw Josie Wells. So these are two of the more notorious Southern sympathizers that rode as guerrilla fighters. There were Union sympathizers as well. One of them was a man by the name of John Kelso. John Kelso lived in Buffalo. He was a school teacher. Buffalo is about, oh, 25, 30 miles north of, uh, northeast of Springfield a little bit. And just like those two, he basically stayed out of the fray in the beginning. And just like them, uh, he became kind of a, a, a wanted man only by the Southerners. And so he decided he was going to be a spy. And so he turned out being a spy for the Union Army. And uh, when his actions were found out by the Southern sympathizers, they burned his farm, house, forced his family into poverty. And it said that he vowed that he was going to kill 25 rebels with his own hands. He said, I'm not going to bushwhack them. I'm not going to shoot them from some tree or behind the rock. I'm going to engage them in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and I'm going to kill them. Uh, by the summer of 1863, he and his little band of partisans began a counterinsurgency force in the Ozarks, and he emerged as one of the more notorious guerrilla fighters, and it said that he more than fulfilled his vow. Uh, he became a really feared, hated, and partisan ranger by the Confederates. Nobody wanted to fight John Kelso because he apparently was a pretty good fighter. Um, 1864, during the middle of the war, he actually uh, ended up running for Congress from Springfield. Ended up beating a man by the name of Sempronius Pony Boyd, which you're going to hear more of in a couple of weeks because he's involved with the Wild Bill Hickok shootout in Springfield, which we're going to talk about next week. And uh, he's also involved with the bringing of the Frisco Railroad. But in 1864, he was the congressman for Springfield, and Kelso took time away from his guerrilla body to actually run for uh, Congress and serving two terms. I don't know how he had time to run for Congress and do all this killing, but apparently he you know, um, made his way about it somehow. After the war, he resumed his teaching duties, but eventually moved to California, where he again got involved with a bunch of vigilantes uh, when there were some uh, activities in some of those boom towns in California. And uh, it's said that he died of an old festering war wound. Said on his deathbed, he said the Civil War had finally killed him um, because of one of his wounds that he had uh, received during the Civil War. This is a photograph of John Kelso during the war. Um, so he was a Union guerrilla fighter. And then there was Jim Lane. Now, Jim Lane was actually a soldier with the Union Army in the beginning. Uh, he led a group of fighters called the Kansas Red Leggers. Uh, and he was an extremely notorious partisan ranger in the beginning. Uh, he was extremely anti-slavery. Uh, he absolutely hated uh, anyone involved with slavery, and he absolutely hated anything associated with Missouri. Uh, I mean, he absolutely despised Missourians. And as a result, it was not unusual for he and his group of two to 300 followers to ride into Missouri and create all sorts of havoc against Southern sympathizers. By the way, the reason they were called red leggers is because they wore actually uh, leather leggings, which went up past their knees or up to their knees, and that was kind of their uniform. 
that they wore. Now, originally, he had the blessing of the government. He was actually a senator from Kansas, believe it or not. And the government, the U.S. government actually paid him and uh, kind of, uh, you know, associated with him. And then he got to the point where he was doing some things that probably the government didn't want to have anything to do with. And they realized it wasn't a good association. So they broke with him. And uh, he no longer uh, was, uh, in a sense, uh, associated with the government. Kind of a wink and a nod type arrangements. They knew what he was doing, uh, but they would disavow any responsibility. He said, hey, we have nothing to do with this guy. He's on his own. Wink, wink. You know, they knew what he was doing, and they were probably paying him under the table. Uh, but nevertheless, this was Jim Lane. Uh, this is a photograph of Jim Lane. Now, I did not per pick this photo out on purpose to <laughs> to uh, show you that he was having a bad hair day. It's just one of those photographs that uh, was taken during the Civil War. Is obviously not very flattering, to say the least. Uh, of all the things that we think about when we think about Jim Lane, we think about the burning of Osceola. Osceola was a really important river town in the Ozarks. It was located on the Osage River, about 50 miles north of Springfield. And it was kind of the furthest reach that, that steamboats could get to. Uh, steamboats could come down the Missouri River, uh, come down the Osage River, just about as far south as Osceola. And then they had to offload their equipment and their supplies and had to be uh, transported by wagon to the Springfield area. As a result, Osceola was a very, very important town. In fact, the case, it was actually larger than Springfield. It actually had about 2,000 citizens in it at this period of time. It was also a hotbed of Southern sympathizers. Remember, uh, the Southern part of Missouri was actually more of a Union uh, area as opposed to the central part of Missouri, which was often called Little Dixie, that's where most of the slave owners lived. So in a sense, most of the Southern sympathizers lay north of the Ozarks. Kind of unusual. We don't think about that in our minds, but that's exactly how it was. And Osceola was a very much a Southern sympathizing area. Uh, the result was that Jim Lane decided he was going to take revenge on Osceola for the uh, loss at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. Remember, Wilson's Creek was fought in the first part of August 1861. Lane led his army of about 200 uh, soldiers over to Osceola about a month, couple, maybe five weeks later, and invaded Osceola and absolutely destroyed the town, killed uh, several residents in the process, uh, stole everything he could get his hands on and transport it back to Kansas. Uh, and this was a, a huge deal, folks. This became a very notorious situation. It inflamed the Southern sympathizers. Uh, Lane was kind of looked upon as being a hero by the North. And uh, it's very you know, very important incident. Uh, by the way, there's one incident associated with this raid, which I guess is not amusing. If I lived in Osceola, I most certainly would not have thought it was amusing. But in retrospect, it kind of is. I guess there was a lot of whiskey in Osceola. You know, this was one of the things that they would transport down on the steamboats and then transport in, in cask and kegs. Well, when they found out that Jim Lane was coming, they tried to hide as much stuff as they could in caves along the side of the river, including barrels of whiskey. Well, Lane was a notorious teetotaler. Uh, he did not want his army drinking whiskey, even though there was probably no way he's going to be able to keep from doing it. Well, a bunch of his raiders found some of the whiskey. And when he found out and got drunk and we found out about it, he got infuriated and he ordered that all the cask of whiskey were to be opened up and poured into the Osage River. The problem is uh, the river caught on fire. I know this doesn't seem hardly possible, but it said that the river actually caught on fire. There was so much whiskey in it 
and end up catching some of the town on fire. And that's how the town burned down, was from the whiskey in the river that caught on fire. Uh, like I said, I know it's not amusing if you lived in El Ciola and you had a house, but you have to admit it is kind of an amusing incident. Very unusual, let's put it that way. The Red Legs also took 360 horses, 400 cattle, 200 slaves, and just took everything they could find that wasn't nailed down with them. They stole everything. Uh, destroyed the community. Osceola never recovered. If you go to Osceola today, there's not much there. It's a very small little town, and it never recovered from this burning uh, and this raid on it. Uh, as you will see, the raid on Osceola serves as a as an, uh, kind of a cause for the Southerners later. So, without a doubt, the most notorious guerrilla fighter that roamed the Ozarks during the Civil War was this man right here, William Clark Quantrill. I would suspect most of you out there have heard of Quantrill. Uh, he was the absolutely uh, face of guerrilla warfare in the Ozarks and uh, the Southern side. Uh, Quantrill was originally an abolitionist from Ohio. He was raised in the North and he was raised in an abolitionist home. And he actually moved to Kansas when all this bleeding Kansas was going on, in a sense, supporting of the abolitionist side. Anyway, that's what his biographers say. Well, somehow he lost a brother. Uh, he was a school teacher, and one of his brothers uh, got killed by Union forces. I don't know if it was done by accident. Uh, I've read a couple of biographies, but it's been a while, and I don't remember the exact incident, but one of his brothers lost his life at the hands of Union sympathizers, and he became radicalized. He decided he totally switched. Before that, he was an abolitionist. Before that, he was a, a school teacher, a kind of a non-political type person, and after his brother got killed, he, like Hildebrand, just like some of the others, just went on a rampage. And he went on a rampage for the Southern side because it was Union people that he felt like killed his brother. Uh, he apparently was an extremely charismatic person. Uh, he fought with the Mexican, with the, pardon me, with the Missouri militia in the beginning. He fought with Sterling Price at Carthage, at Wilson's Creek, at Lexington, at Pea Ridge. Uh, he was part of the Missouri militia. But apparently after all this and all through the defeats, he became disillusioned. He decided that the Southerners were not fighting the way they should fight. So he decided that he was going to form his own band of partisan rangers, and he was going to fight the war in a more appropriate way, in his mind at least. And so he forms his band. This is a photograph of William Clark Quantrill before the war. And this is a photograph of William Clark Quantrell during the war. Now, you'll notice he's wearing a Confederate uniform. There was a period of time there when the Confederacy, uh, you know, associated with Quantrell. But then it got to the point where some of the activities he was involved in were so hostile and so terrible that even the Confederate Army decided they didn't want to be involved with him anymore. And they cut ties with him. again probably like with Jim Lane, they probably did it with a wink and a nod. But anyway, uh, Quantrell uh, becomes the face of the guerrilla warfare. Uh, he became a very violent man and he became a really uh, vicious man and very successful, you know, at doing what he was doing. Several people that we know today from history rode with Quantrell. Frank and Jesse James, Cole Younger, and some of his brothers, a man by the name of Bloody Bill Anderson, which you'll hear about in a minute. Uh, all of these were riders with the Quantrell gang that rode, out, rode throughout the Ozarks. He had a band of about 300 men. And it was in 1863 that he decided to launch a huge attack upon what he considered to be the uh, kind of center 
of all the union activities in the Midwest. Lawrence, Kansas. Here's Frank and Jesse James uh, at a period of time when they would have ridden with Quantrell. This was Frank James uh, about the Civil War era. And this is a very young Jesse James. These are two of the documented photographs that we have of the two. Uh, Jesse would only have been about 17, 18. Frank would have been in his early 20s. He was a little bit older than Jesse at this period of time. Uh, this is the youngers that rode with the Quantrill gang. You got John up here, and that's how he looked later. Bob Younger, uh, Jim Younger, and the oldest, Cole Younger. Cole was the only one that survived uh, after the Civil War. The other ones all died uh, in the James Younger gang during the 1870s and early 1880s. Most of them got killed in something called the Norfield, Minnesota raid, uh, where they tried to rob a bank in Minnesota and got slaughtered. And really only Jesse James and Cole and Frank James and Cole Younger survived and got away. And Cole Younger actually went to prison over it. Uh, so what happened in Lawrence, Kansas? Well, in the spring of 1863, uh, the Union Army had rounded up a lot of Southern sympathizers and jailed them in Kansas City. Uh, they were trying to to you know, arrest anybody that they could associate with this with Quantrell's gang. One of them happened to be Bill Anderson's sister. Bill Anderson was riding with Quantrell's gang. Well, the jail collapsed and killed several people, including Anderson's sister. And it said that Anderson just went absolutely nuts over this uh, because he felt like you know she was just an innocent person. She had nothing to do with the war. She had nothing to do with his activities. And, you know, remember, this is still a period of time when women and children were kind of thought to be immune from all this. Well, he just went nuts. Uh, and if he wasn't violent and he wasn't psychopathic before this, he most certainly was after this. The result was that Quantrell being as how Anderson was one of his loyal compatriots, decided to take revenge for this loss of life at this jail. So he decides he's going to raid Lawrence, Kansas. Now, in the minds of the Southerners in Missouri and the Ozarks, Lawrence, Kansas was like Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, it was the face of everything they hated uh, in, you know, in the north uh, it was an abolitionist town it had newspapers jim lane lived there i mean everything they associated with evil in their minds resided in lawrence kansas so quantrell decides he's going to raid lawrence kansas in the spring of 1863 he gets up his army of about 300 people they ride to lawrence and they attacked the town. It's it's fortified. It's got some Union troops there, but they're so disorganized and they're so unsuspecting that anything like this is going to happen that uh, it's you know they 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 can't fight them all. Uh, so August eighteen sixty three, they come charging in Lawrence, yelling, "Remember Osceola! Remember that's where Jim Lane burned the town of Osceola, and this is where Jim Lane lived." They had a they had a hit list. Uh, Quantrell had provided his soldiers with a written list of people that they were to hunt down and kill, uh, people that were associated with the northern side. Uh, they burned the city to the ground. They looted it. They killed 183 civilians in targeted attacks. I mean, folks, this wasn't, I mean, this was a good sized battle. Uh, remember, there were just a little over 200 killed on both sides at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. He killed 183 civilians. Didn't have anything to do with the army. Uh, it was just a horrible situation. This, in a sense, made Quantrell the face of the guerrilla war. And he became the most wanted man by the Union forces for a long time during the war. He uh, actually ended up fighting on until he was caught in 1865 after the war was over in Kentucky, and he was assassinated by Union soldiers. 
uh, and kill, assassinated. He was killed because he was a wanted man by the by the government. Um, this is a painting of the raid on Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, I talked about this at the township last week. We're a week ahead of you guys. And uh, <clears throat> I showed them a film clip from something called Ride with the Devil. It was a movie that was made, oh, probably 20 years ago. Uh, excellent movie. If you get a chance to watch it, I would encourage you to do so. It's very historically accurate. It's a, it, you know, it has a plot to it. It's not got anything to do with probably historical. But the burning and the looting of Lawrence it's about a 10 minute segment and it's as spot on as anything I've seen in historical events that's bit that's portrayed in movies. It was very accurately done, very much researched and obviously uh, pretty much what happened. So if you get a chance, watch it. It's called Ride with the Devil. Uh, so what happened after this? Well, for one thing, Quantrell decided he was going to have to rid himself of Anderson. He realized after the fact that Anderson had just gone nuts. I mean, he was absolutely psychopathic. And he decided he had to get rid of him because he knew the Union Army was going to come looking for him. And he decided he needed to get rid of Anderson. So he basically ejected Anderson from his gang. He took with him the James brothers, the younger brothers, uh, the group that ended up being the, the outlaw gang after the Civil War went with Anderson. And Anderson went on his own rampage. And uh, he wasn't, he was actually worse than Quantrell, if that tells you anything. His most famous attack was at a place called Centralia, Missouri, up on the Missouri River, 1864, where he attacked the town. And uh, so happened that there was a uh, train uh, in the town that had stopped had 24 unarmed Union soldiers headed for a hospital in Iowa. They were all injured. He brought them out of the train, lined them up, executed them in front of the whole town, and then sacked and burned the town and killed some civilians on top of that. Uh, ended up killing over 100 civilians in the process. So uh, as you can see, Anderson was just an absolutely crazy man. It had got to the point where they were raping female victims, which was almost unheard of, folks. You didn't do that in the Civil War. Um, even Either side, they, they respected women, but his gang was raping female victims. They were scalping them. They were beheading the victims. Uh, they were just, I mean, they, they were, uh, had just gone on a complete rampage. They had completely lost all sense of what was right and wrong. Uh, he was finally hunted down by Union soldiers in a little town called Albany, Missouri, which is up in the northern part of Missouri in 1864. And uh, most of his gang dissipated and tried to uh, go back and live in their homes because they knew they were wanted men after riding with Anderson. This is a picture of Bloody Bill Anderson taken during the war this is a picture of Bloody Bill Anderson taken after his assassination, after he was killed. Uh, they did this routinely. I know it's a gruesome picture, but, you know, I kind of wanted to show it to you because it kind of gives you a demonstration of how violent this event was during the war. It was, a, it was a really horrible situation. Now, in order to try to prevent all this guerrilla warfare, the Union Army issued something called Order Number 11. Uh, the place where most of these guerrilla fighters lived and were protected was on the edge of the western part of Missouri in about four counties south of Kansas City to about Joplin. Um, and so the general in charge of the Missouri Army issued something called Order Number 11. And he ordered that the counties of Bates Cass, Jackson, and Vernon were to be evacuated, and all towns but the county seats were to be destroyed. All the crops destroyed, all the animals confiscated, all the people forced to leave, because he thought that they were hiding these guerrilla fighters, and they were. So he ordered that all these counties be completely destroyed. Now, you might imagine, 
that didn't exactly gain him a lot of sympathy with the Southerners. And uh, even people that were not Southerners thought it was wrong. Uh, the area became known as the Burt District. And if you were to go there today, if you know anything about that area between Joplin and Kansas City, uh, except for Jackson County, uh, there's no lot there anymore, folks. It's a pretty sparsely populated area. And there are really not very many towns of any size. Uh, George Caitlin Bingham, Bingham decided he was going to per, uh, make him famous, the Union General, because he was so upset with this. He said, I'm going to make, I'm going to paint a painting and you're going to become famous as a result of it. And he did indeed paint a painting and I'll show you to you in a minute. This is the Burnt District. This is Kansas City. It's called Westport then. And this is Independence over here. So all this area here, Cass County, county seat of Harrisonville, uh, remained Bates County, the county seat of Butler, Vernon County, the county seat of Nevada. Folks, if you were to go particularly these two counties, Vernon County and Bates County in the lower part of Cass County, it, it's a pretty sparsely populated area even today. And there are not any big towns in this area except for Butler and Nevada and Harrisonville. Now, once you get up north of Harrisonville, obviously you're getting into the suburbs of Kansas City. So, you know, it's really grown. But uh, this was the Burnt District. And this is, a, this is kind of a memorial to it that they have. This is a painting that uh, George Caleb Bingham did called the Order Number 11, uh, which he said, I'm going to make you famous. You'll notice that the people enforcing order number 11 were Jim Lane's red, red leggers. Uh, the Union General had Lane come over and, and evacuate the people and uh, burn the places down. There's one last thing I want to tell you, and I'm going to do it really rapidly because I want to make, I, I know I'm running out of time. I'll bet you a lot of people out there have probably ridden the train at Silver Dollar City and been robbed. You know, Silver Dollar City is an amusement park around Branson. Uh, you probably don't remember, but the man that announces himself as the Robin Train is Al Bolin. Well, folks, Alf Bolin was a real man. Now, he was one of these partisan rangers. Well, he really wasn't. He was a serial killer. Uh, he, took, he took advantage of how bad things were in the Ozarks to rob and rape and kill. He didn't care if you were Union or Southern. He would do it one way or the other. And uh, he ended up being uh, probably the most notorious Southern uh, guerrilla fighter is since and since in this area. Uh, he did most of his killing around Forsyth, Missouri, at a place called Murder Rocks. And uh, he was finally lured into a cabin by a young Union soldier and killed. And then to make sure that he could prove that he was killed, uh, he cut his head off, took it to Ozark, mounted it on a pole. And after a couple of days, they took it down and took it to Springfield, mounted it back on the pole and square. And that's where it sat for a few days. Uh, I know, sounds horrible. Uh, this is a reputed picture of Alf Bolin and one of his friends. I This has never been documented. I don't know that this is the real Alf Bolin, but this is a photograph of somebody that they say may be him. Uh, so this is Murder Rocks. This is where he did most of his murdering. Of course, out of all this, one of the things that came out of all this was the outlaw gangs that rode in the Old West, the James Gang, the Younger Brothers, the Dalton Gang, the Doolin Gang, Bell Star. These are some of the big outlaw gangs that had their their start in this guerrilla warfare in Missouri and in the Ozarks. So I've already gone over. I've run out of time. Uh, I'm going to have to leave you now. Next week, we're going to talk about, start talking about what happened after the guerrilla war, after the civil war in the Ozarks. The Ozarks is a wild west area. And the center of the Ozarks, as far as being wild west, was Springfield, Missouri. <laughs> uh, and none other than Wild Bill Hickok made it his home. And he is involved in probably the first great gunfight of the Old West 
in the square at Springfield, Missouri. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. So I encourage you to be with us. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I appreciate uh, your interest. And we will see you next week. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Oh, wow.